Okay. Hi. Welcome to another session of the Potter's Roundtable from Washington Street Studios. I'm Phil Bernberg. Last time, the top, what we talked about was uh, pyrometric cones, and we've been, we've been doing these talks in sort of the normal sequence of, of events or steps that you would do to produce pottery. So today we're going to be talking about what happens in a glazed firing. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable, a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. And by definition, what I really mean by a glaze firing is the final high temperature firing that's used for stoneware or porcelain to really accomplish two goals. One is to vitrify the clay, that is to densify the clay and have the clay get dense and non-porous and hard and strong, and also to form and melt the glaze. So what happens in this, in this glaze firing? Overall, there's a whole series of complicated chemical and physical changes that occur in the clay and in the glaze as the kiln heats up, but there are also some changes that occur as the kiln cools down, and we'll talk about those. So let's talk about some of these changes. First of all, let's start with the clay body, what happens in the clay body, and the sequence of events or the sequence of changes that occurs as we heat up the clay. Well, the first thing that happens is, as we're heating up the, the, the clay body, it eventually reaches the original bisque temperature. So in a sense, we're repeating the bisque firing, um, only now we can, as we'll talk about later, we can actually go a little faster. But we reach the bisque temperature, and then at the bisque temperature, there are, there's a series of new changes and reactions that occur. And I've outlined them briefly on the board here. We'll talk about these. The first thing that happens is the, cl the clay, and I've, I've also included the formulas up here in case you're interested in formulas or you want to sort of, we can talk a little bit about the changes in the chemistry. The clay, which starts out originally as wet clay, and this is the formula for kaolinite, the m major mineral that occurs, the clay mineral that occurs in the clay, aluminum oxide, two silica, two water. During the bisque firing, and also during the early stages of the, the glaze firing, it changes to metakaolin. You remember from when we were talking about what is clay and clay bodies and bisque firing, that I said that once the clay is fired to a bisque temperature, technically it's no longer clay. We still refer to it as clay, but it actually isn't. It's what's called metakaolin, meta meaning changed kaolin. And the big difference is the, the chemical water or the structural water that's that was in the clay has been removed by the bisque firing. So instead of the clay having this formula with water as part of it, it now basically has this formula. The water has been removed, and it no longer behaves like clay. It doesn't absorb water. It's not slippery when it's wet. It doesn't get soft when it gets wet. So it, if, if, the, if the change to, from clay to metakaolin hasn't completely finished happening in the bisque firing, then it, 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 it's completed during the glaze firing. And as the temperature continues to increase, then the metakaolin changes again, and it changes into two materials. It actually splits and changes into another, another material called mullite. This is actually also occurs as a naturally occurring mineral with a slightly different formula, proportions of the aluminum silica, and it also forms silica. So the, the metakaolin actually sort of splits into two materials, and it forms crystals of mullite, and silica. That's the first, that's, and this happens over the whole range of the fire. This is happening during the whole range of the firing. Another thing that's happening that um, maybe starts a little, it starts a little later in the sequence than this one, is that if there's any silica present in the clay, and there always is, there's, either, there's silica present either as an intentional addition to the clay body, that's usually one of the components when you formulate a clay body, or there's silica present as an impurity in the clay, well, what happens is, as the, as the temperature increases, the fluxes that are present in the clay body start to cause the silica to melt. The silica won't melt by itself. It melts at too high a temperature. But with the presence of the fluxes, like feldspars and other unintentional impurities, the silica starts to melt in the clay body. Another thing, that, the next, another thing that's happening also, at, more or less at the same time, is that what I'm calling sintering. This is where the individual particles of whatever the materials are, the mullite or the silica, are starting to bond together. Atoms are actually moving around and relocating and joining particles together. And so what happens with the sintering is this is where the clay is actually getting denser. The particles are essentially being reorganized and packed closer together. The holes and the spaces are being removed, and the whole body is shrinking. 
So the body is, and, and the, 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 when the silica melts, that actually helps in the sintering. The liquid actually helps with, for the atoms to be able to move around and rearrange themselves and helps with the sintering. And finally, when you get up to fairly high temperatures where the, most of the reactions have occurred with, within the clay body and the glazes already start to melt, now you start actually to get a reaction between the clay and the glaze. And you form what you may have heard this term as the interface or the interfacial region this is like a zone but below the glaze and above the clay. It's a new zone that forms by a reaction between the clay body and the glaze. And it has different properties. It's really a combination of the two. It's not the same as the clay, and it's not the same as the glaze. It's sort of a combination of the two. So the point is, all of these are happening more or less at the same time over a long period of time during the, during the heating stage of the firing. Now as the clay body, let's say you get to the end of the firing, and, the, and you turn off the kiln or the firing ends, and now the kiln starts to cool, well, there are some things that are still happening with the clay body while it's cooling. First thing that happens during the whole period of time is the clay body contracts. As you're probably aware, most materials, when you heat them up, they expand, and when you cool them back down, they, they, they shrink back down. And so the clay body does this. The, whatever the, the new clay body, essentially, that has formed at high temperature now starts to contract as the temperature decreases, and it shrinks a little bit. But there are two other significant things that happen when it shrinks. Um, there are, there are, there are I, I need to make a little bit of a side trip here to talk about this. Silica, we, we mentioned that there's silica in the clay body. Silica actually exists in a number of different forms. It still is all SiO2, it's still the same composition, but if you slightly rearrange the atoms in different positions, you get a slightly different structure, and if you have a slightly different structure, then you have slightly different properties. And they're different enough where we give these, they're called phases, we give them different names because they actually have different properties. So there's quartz, which we're very familiar with, and quartz actually, actually has two forms itself. There's what we call low temperature and high temperature, which we'll talk more about later. There's another form of silica called tritomite, which we don't see very often in pottery. And then there's another form with, called cristobalite, and that also has a low temperature and a high temperature form. And in general, if you take silica and you just heat it up as the temperature increases, it changes from quartz to tritomite to cristobalite. So one of the things that happens, and, and, so, and, and the same way if you heat quartz up, if it starts at the low temperature form, it'll change to the high temperature form. And as it cools back down, it goes back from the high temperature form to the low temperature form. Now, the, the, the point about that is that when the clay body is contracting, the clay body contracts. If there's any quartz left as it's cooling down, the quartz will also contract when it goes from the high temperature form to the back to the low temperature form. So at around 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, just really roughly because it's easy to remember, around 1,000 degrees, as the clay body is cooling back down, any quartz that's still in the clay body that hasn't melted or changed into something else will now change from the the high temperature quartz to the low temperature quartz form. And when it does, there's almost an instantaneous small shrinkage. And also, if, if, any, if any cristobalite, we're gonna talk about more about this in, in, in later discussions, but if any cristobalite has formed at the high temperature as a result of the heating, when it cools back down, it will also shrink. And it does it at around 500 degrees. So first the quartz contracts at around 1,000, and then at around 500 degrees Fahrenheit, if there's any cristobalite there, it also shrinks. And it's almost an instantaneous shrinkage, very quick. And I just wanted to mention these now because this, is, this will be really significant later on when we talk about glaze defects and body defects in particular. So I just wanted to introduce it at this point. Okay. So let's, let's move on now. Let's assume that, okay, so the clay body has cooled back down it's contracted and it finally gets down to room temperature. Let's, let's talk now about the glaze layer. So we're starting out when at the beginning of the firing, there's a, there's a coating of dried glaze or the powder that's sitting on the, the surface of the pots. And as the temperature increases, there's a different sequence of events that occurs within the glaze layer. First of all, one of the early things that happens is the, the clay that's in the glaze recipe goes through the bisque firing cycle. So the water that was in the clay, that was in the glaze recipe, is driven out of the clay. So essentially the, the, the glaze now gets bisque fired. And at this point, early in the firing, 
If you're firing in reduction, because these principles apply whether you're firing in electric kiln, wood kiln, gas kiln, basic principles are all the same. So there's another change that occurs at this point. We want it to occur at this point if we're firing in reduction. You remember reduction is where we're controlling the atmosphere of the kiln when we burn some fuel, and we don't have enough air to completely burn all the fuel. So one of the things that can, early on, fairly early on in a, reduction, in a reduction firing, you go through a period of what's called body reduction, which is a little bit of a misnomer, because actually what we're trying to do at that point in the firing is we're also trying to reduce the glazes. The main reason for firing in reduction is to achieve certain color differences and color reactions. And so we want, there are certain chemical reactions we want to occur to bring about those color changes. So in reduction, there's an early period in the firing. It can, the range is variable, but it can be anywhere from roughly cone 012 to about cone 06. And you purposely put the kiln into reduction to bring about these chemical changes. You want to reduce the body, and you also want to reduce certain elements or certain materials in the glaze, and this is two of them. In reduction, iron and copper, iron oxide and, and copper oxide, are very common colorants in glazes, and also in the clay body the iron primarily, um, but you can get a wide range of colors from these materials depending on the particular form. And the point is, there are different forms of iron oxides. There's one form called, and you've probably heard this term called red iron oxide. It's also the same material is called ferric oxide, and the formula is Fe2O3. There's another form of iron, of iron oxide, slightly different formula, called black iron oxide. This is also a fairly common glaze ingredient. It's called ferrous oxide, or ferrous ferric, actually, a combination of the two, and the formula is Fe304. And the point is, depending on the atmosphere in the kiln, I can change back and forth between these two. If I start off with red iron oxide and I, and I put it into reduction, I can change it to black. And the, 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 the reason why I'm doing that is because the, the iron oxide that's in this form produces different colors in the glaze than this one would. So this is an intentional change we're trying to bring about. Similarly, copper is very sensitive to the, condi the atmospheric conditions in the kiln, and it exists in at least two forms. Black, which is also called cupric oxide, and the formula is CuO, or red, it's a red powder, also called cuprous, and the formula is Cu2O. And again, I can change, I can change one back and forth to the other, depending on if I start here and I go to and I put it in reduction, I go to there. If I, if, I'm, if I have this form and I fire it in oxidation, I go back to this one. So I can change it back and forth. So early in the firing during reduction, I'm, in, I'm purposely putting the kiln into a state of reduction to bring about these changes. Okay. Now, okay. So now, I, as I continue the, the heating up of, of the, the, the glaze in this case, eventually at some point, some of the individual glaze ingredients start to melt. An important point here to remember is that is that not all the, the ingredients in a glaze melt at the same point. Even though we, we think of the fact that we're trying to eventually achieve a glaze that's completely melted, during the heating process, it doesn't all melt at once. We wouldn't want it to melt all at once, because if it did, it would melt more like ice, and it would run off the pot. It would be very hard to control the firing if it melted all at once, because it would be too easy to be underfired or overfired. So when we're formulating glazes, which we'll talk about later when we talk about glaze formulations in future sessions, one of the, the goals is to achieve a glaze that starts to melt as you heat it up, and as you continue the heating, it melts a little bit more, and then it melts a little bit more, and a little bit more, and finally it becomes completely molten. And that way the glaze is a lot less temperature sensitive or heat sensitive, and it has a, it's, more, it has a, it's more tolerant of the firing range. We hope you're enjoying the show. Please take a moment to leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps new listeners find the show. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates as new episodes are released. And if you'd like to support the video and podcast production of the Potter's Roundtable, become a patron. Go to patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Your support will help us achieve our goal of creating a digital library spanning the ceramic arts for use by educators and artists alike. Thank you for your support. Now let's get back to the show. So as you're heating it up, some of the ingredients on the glaze start to melt. And some of, the early, some of the early ingredients that may melt are like fritz. Most of the fritz that we use in glaze recipes typically melt 
at earthenware temperatures, fairly low, bisque temperatures. So they're going to start to melt fairly early. Boron compounds, borates, like Gersley borate or colmanite, they're going to start to melt fairly early. Soda ash, sodium carbonate, that's going to start to melt fairly early. Okay, so I start, I start to get some melting with some of these early ingredients. One of the other things that's happening at this point and continues for the whole rest of the firing is that there are some ingredients that, and components that we use in the glaze that are actually going to break down. And a good example is whiting. Whiting is a very common glaze ingredient. And chemically, it's calcium carbonate. Well, when I heat up whiting, again, very common glaze ingredient, when I heat up whiting, what happens is it breaks down and it forms calcium oxide plus carbon dioxide gas. This is exactly what we want to happen because the calcium, calcium oxide is a flux and it reacts with the other ingredients in the glaze, but the carbon dioxide gas comes off. Well, so during the firing, by the time the glaze has started to melt, I've also got gas that's being produced by some of the ingredients in the glaze that's bubbling up through the glaze and being released from the glaze. And I also, there are certain impurities in the glaze, in the glaze or, or, the, or, the, or that may also be releasing um, gases, like sulfates. We don't normally use sulfates as glaze ingredients, but they can be present as impurities, and they'll produce sulfur gas, different sulfur oxides that will be coming off. Okay, so now I can, I've got gases bubbling up and I've got things starting to melt. Um, now, eventually, I get to the point where the whole glaze is completely molten. It's completely melted. And one of the points at, at this point is the fact that melted glass is actually very corrosive. It will eat into a lot of other materials because it's very active chemically. So this is the point where, when the glaze is completely molten, it'll actually start to eat into the clay. And as I mentioned when talking about the clay, now the, the, the clay is hot and at high temperature, and now I have this liquid glass sitting onto the surface. The liquid glass starts attacking the clay and produces this interlayer, this zone at the base of the glaze, which is different from the glaze and the clay alone. So I produced a new composition basically at the base. Okay, so now as the glaze cools, so that, at that point, and I'm holding maybe and the glaze is fully mature, and I say, okay, the firing's done, I end the firing and the, and, the, and the kiln starts cooling. So while at, at the beginning of the cooling stage of the, the glaze, a couple of things are happening. First of all, gas bubbles may still be being produced and they can continue to bubble up through the glaze if they haven't been removed completely earlier. But also this is important because this is when crystals form. Usually crystals don't form in the glaze, very unusual to form during heating, they form during cooling. So when the glaze starts to cool, atoms start moving around in the, in the still liquid glaze, and they start forming together basically in clumps, and they start to reorganize and form crystals. So this is when the crystals grow, and the, the, when, the, when the, uh, the glaze is starting to cool. As the glaze continues to cool, it reaches a point that's called, or temperature, that's called the set point. This is the point where the glaze freezes. We don't usually think of terminology like freezing because we, we associate it with water. We don't usually associate it with temperatures of 2,000 degrees. But basically, the liquid glaze now freezes and becomes a solid. And at this point, crystallization ends. The atoms are not free to move around anymore and reorganize, so no more crystals form in the glaze once the glaze becomes solid. Um, and at this point also, this is kind of the end of the period when the, the atmosphere in the kiln can really significantly affect the glaze. Once the glaze becomes solid, the atoms in the gas really can't penetrate into the glaze that much. So if there's a difference between oxidation and reduction, at the most, it can only really affect the surface of the glaze. It can no longer penetrate into the glaze body itself. And then at, from this point on, the same thing happens now with the glaze that happened with the clay body. The glaze cools down and it contracts and shrinks um, as it cools down. Now, the, the, one, the, the point, to, one point, uh, sort of a little bit of a side point I wanted to make here was that one of the problems that occurs with, um, first of all, during this process of the heating and the cooling, defects may have formed in the clay and the glaze. And one of the problems, the common problems that people run into is that some of the defects only show up during, the, during this final firing, but they may have nothing to do with the firing or they may have multiple causes. So it's very, in some cases, it's very difficult to diagnose the source of the problem. Just as a couple of quick examples, dunting cracks, which are sort of random cracks that can, that can penetrate a whole complete clay body, they can be due to the clay composition, 
to the presence of a lot of silica. They could also be due to or contributed to by the firing where you've extended it to the firing for a long time at high temperature and you've made a lot of crystobalite. And when the crystobalite cools down, it shrinks and causes the body to crack. Bloating also can be caused by impurities, for example, in the clay body, but it can also be exasperated by, by, by low temperature reduction, early reduction, heavy reduction. So it's hard for these and a lot of other defects. We're, we're going to talk a lot more about clay defects and glaze defects later on in this whole series of lectures. But it's difficult sometimes to diagnose them. Glaze defects, they're similar. For instance, like one of the really common glaze defects that, that shows up after glaze firing is crawling. And this is where the glaze seems to sort of separate and part and move back and leave, expose bare areas. And crawling is an example of a, of a defect that has nothing to do with the firing. It's caused by, it might be caused by or contributed to the glaze composition or your previous handling or the way that you applied the glaze. But the problem is it only shows up when the glaze melts and is fired. So it's, again, it's very difficult sometimes to track these back to the original source when they only show up at the end. So in, in conclusion, I just had a couple of things that I wanted, I, I'd like to suggest that you remember um, as far as the, the, the glaze firing is concerned. First of all, when you're loading the kiln, keep in mind where the heat is coming from. And this is different whether it's an electric kiln or a gas kiln or a wood kiln. Where is the heat source and how do you have to arrange the pots so that they can get maximum heat and uniform heating from, the, from the, the, whatever the heat source is. And in an electric kiln, for example, that means you don't want to put large, tall pots on the outside of a shelf and small ones in the middle because the heat is coming from the outside. It's coming from the walls. And so that would, if you did that, that would create a barrier to the pots that are in the middle of the shelf. So you, you want to sort of think about how can you get the most uniform heating because you're trying to get uniform firing, maturing of the clay, and uniform formation and melting of the glazes. The other thing that I've said before, and I'll say it again, is we t when we talked about pyrometric cones, is you really should be monitoring your firing using cones. That is, you watch the cones fall, and when the cones, when the particular cone, the target cone or the, the, the witness cone that you're looking at falls, you, you end the firing, you turn off the kiln. You don't rely on the kiln to shut off. And temperature is, monitoring temperature is great for monitoring the progress of the heating. I do that, we do that very often here because I want to see if is the kiln continuing to heat up properly, especially when we fire a gas kiln. Has the, has the heating somehow declined or leveled off? Has, has it stalled? So I use that, but I don't, we don't use that to monitor the actual maturing of the, the clay and the glaze. We do that with cones. And probably the single most important point from this whole discussion today is to remember that we talked about all these changes. It takes time for these changes to occur. There are changes, a whole series of these changes that are occurring during the firing in the clay and a, and a, a parallel series of changes that's occurring to the glaze. And it takes time for them to occur. So the point is, and not just instant heat. So the point is, don't rush your firing. That, but this doesn't mean that the whole firing has to be slow. The really, the, your goal should be to optimize the firing schedule. There are times during the firing schedule when you can go very, you can heat up the kiln very quickly, and there are other times when you know that, when you understand and know what's happening, that you have to go more slowly to allow those processes to occur. So you really want to optimize the firing. So, for example, you can begin if you're starting off with a glaze firing and you suspect that the glazes may not have been completely dried. Maybe you, you, you glazed them the night before, you loaded them into the kiln because you're in a hurry, which it happens fairly often. And so now, but you don't want to blow up your pots now because the pots are still wet from the wet glaze. So okay, in that case, you might want to slow down the firing very early on until essentially you dry out the glaze. But after that point, if you think about it, the pots have already gone through a bisque firing. So there's no reason at all, other than maybe a wet glaze, to have to go slowly back up to the bis temperatures, with the exception of maybe this reduction period that you're going through, if you're having a reduction. So you can eventually, once the initial part is over, then you can speed up again. But at, toward the end of the firing, you want to slow down again, because this is where you want all these reactions. You want to make sure that all these reactions and changes have had time to, to finish. You also want to make sure that the temperature in the kiln is uniform. If you tend to heat up a kiln quickly, you tend to exaggerate temperature differences within the kiln. So by slowing down at the end, you allow the temperatures to become more uniform. And if you're firing reduction, this also gives you an opportunity to adjust or make sure that your reduction conditions are uniform throughout the body of the kiln. So you need time to complete, and you need time to complete the melting of the glaze. People don't think about it, but with all these different raw materials and ingredients in a glaze, some of the particles have some of the particles have a finer 
particle size than others. And so it takes time for, if there are coarser particles in one of the ingredients, the larger particles take longer to melt. So we have to allow time for the fact that these larger particles have, have time to melt. We also want to, if possible, we want to make sure that all the gases that were being generated in the kiln have completely left, left the glaze. Otherwise, we end up with defects with blisters and bubbles on the surface of the glaze. And finally, we even want to allow a little bit of time for all the ingredients to blend within the, gra the glaze. Even though the glazes are pretty well mixed and when they're applied, the, on a small scale, we still want time for all the individual atoms to move around and sort of homogenize themselves so that the glaze ends up the same composition and therefore the same appearance everywhere on the pot. Another point that I, I, we found is very useful here at Washington Street Studios is to use a hold at the end of the glaze firing. And this, again, this helps accomplish those, those things I just mentioned. For example, when we fire to cone 6, when we do our standard cone 6 electric firings, we don't fire to cone 6. We fire to cone 5, and then we add a 25-minute hold on the end. If you remember from our discussion of pyrometric cones, cones respond to temperature and time. So by adding time at the end of cone 5, I'm essentially adding another cone. So we get the effects of cone 6, even though I, my target is cone 5, and I add a hold. And I found we get much more uniform and much more mature glaze results that way. In general, also, cooling for most glazes gives better glaze results. If you have any way to control the cooling of a glaze, generally the slower the glaze cools, the better the results are going to be. Um, this is easy if you have a kiln, a gas kiln, for example, or a wood kiln that has hard or dense fire bricks because the kiln naturally holds the heat and tends to cool slowly. If you don't, if you have a kiln that cools rapidly, which is the case for most electric kilns or gas kilns that are made with insulating fire brick, then you can do what's called firing down. And what this means is instead of turning the kiln off or turning the fuel off at high temperature, you decrease the temperature slowly and you control the cooling that way until you get down to several hundred degrees below the final temperature, and then you turn it off. And this slows down the cooling. What this is doing is this is prolonging the time when crystals can form. And a lot of glazes, ideally, you want them to, to, to be able to form crystals. This is especially true of matte glazes. You'll get your best matte glazes if you slow down that initial cooling and allow more of the crystals to form. And lastly, I'd say don't open a hot kiln. If the glaze, at, I, don't, I don't open a kiln or touch the kiln until I, can, I feel I can actually handle the pots with my bare hands. Because... If the glaze has a tendency at all to craze, and that is form these, this network of fine cracks, you're going to exaggerate it or exasperate it by, by shocking it by opening the kiln too quickly. So I, I recommend, you know, unless it's an emergency, and I can't imagine too many pottery emergencies, don't open the kiln while it's still hot. Okay, well that's all we had for our, that's all we had for our topic today. So we hope that this discussion has been useful. If you enjoyed it, please, please like it and subscribe to our channel and share it with your friends and other potters. This helps get our videos noticed on YouTube. If you'd like to support our educational outreach efforts, um, go to patreon.com and look for the Potter's Roundtable. Um, also, check out our website, www.hfclay.com. The next topic in the series, we're gonna, actually going to be starting the next section in this whole, in this whole procedure. We've decided to call this whole, this whole topic, really, um, understanding pottery. That's what the umbrella topic is for the our whole thing. So that we're going to be going to the next section, which is going to be use of raw materials. And our first topic will be introductory chemistry for potters. We're going to be talking um, later about the actual glaze chemistry. But this is just an introduction intended for people that have had no chemical background, a little bit of the terminology and a little bit of the familiarity with some of the chemical terms so that when we start talking about glaze chemistry, it'll be a little easier, and you'll be able to go, oh, yeah, I remember what that means, or at least I heard the term. I don't remember what it means, but I heard the term before, okay? Okay, well, thank you very much for visiting with us today. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.